To fully understand the magnitude of this game, one must go back one week to November 22nd, 1984, Thanksgiving Day at Diablo Valley College in Concord, California, before 3,000 Thanksgiving Day fans, approximately 2,500 of them were Antioch supporters. When I, you know, the, the one thing that really stands out is the Kennedy Antioch game that was on Thanksgiving Day and I know that we ruined Thanksgiving dinner for a whole lot of people in Antioch because they were supremely confident I mean they had I remember when they came out of the field they had these black capes on and they must have had like 75 guys and you know a marching band and the stands I mean when they came out on the field I think the whole field tilted because they just had so much on their side and we had you know, we had our little 35 guys at Kennedy, no cheerleaders, no band. You know, we had a few parents and, you know, we played some Michael Jackson records or whatever, but they had the band and everything. I mean, they were the total program back then. And uh, we made a big goal line stand at the, at the end and uh, Maddie Felder made some great plays for us that day. And that's probably the best Thanksgiving I ever had. The Antioch game was a complete shocker, an upset of epic proportions. The Eagles made a little work go a long way to meet El Cerrito in the title game at the Coliseum. El Cerrito dominated San Ramon 38-13 in the semifinals. You know, the week prior with San Ramon, I'm referring to the San Ramon Thanksgiving game, that was, you know, Tough football game, as I recall. You know, we beat them four touchdowns to one, maybe, and uh, that was more of a struggle. And uh, and it wasn't at the beginning of that game. It, it, it was close for the first quarter, then first quarter and a half, and then we finally took over when the breaks went our way. Players from both teams were rooting for each other to win so they could meet one more time in the Coliseum. In 1984, the Kennedy Eagles entered the playoffs as the second place team. And it was just, it was just part of having fun. It, that's what it was. Just, just everybody out there having fun, man, wanting to really just contribute in some way. We had played each other once uh, in the regular season, but, um, you know, and that really was like a, it was a game that was, that was publicized in the media, but it wasn't, it, it didn't have the, uh, it didn't have the dynamic of the media uh, as as it did when we when we were doing the Coliseum game. You know, the media. It was like every single day of the week, the media had something in the paper. You know, could it be, you know, an all RBA bowl? You know, and and they led it up to the it, to the climax. And so if I can recall, right, some of the newspaper articles, they, they had both schools and f pictures of uh, in the media from both schools with all the students, you know, the student body just in front of each school, you know, and they put them like right on top of each other. And so that was um, the I think the media, you know, made it into something real special. Well, so much was for the community, uh, like I said. I arrived at Kennedy and there would be students from El Cerrito with their helmets at the bus stop right across the street from Kennedy getting ready to go to school. So the, the students were so intertwined just, you know, based on their home lives. Uh, so th that natural rivalry w was always there. And uh, so we really didn't have to be, and I, I can remember playing at El Cerrito many times and looking out on the track and there'd be six and seven people deep on the track. 
and I'd have people come up to me. It was like handicap on a horse race. They'd want to know, is so-and-so healthy? Is so-and-so healthy? And, and what are you going to do about this? And, and then I'd see a whole lot of money changing hands. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of felt responsible for some people's financial status at that point. But, you know, it, it was all good. Even though they were now on different teams, rival schools, many of the Soul Bowl players started with one organization, the Richmond Steelers. Well, there, there was that year where there was no Pop Warner program, and so the community was really itching to, to get it back started again. And it worked out very well because it, came, it became like a feeder system for, for us at Kennedy. And so I would coach the, the Steelers, uh, and and uh, after school I would coach the JVs at Kennedy then I go over to Nickel Park at six o'clock and coach the Steelers and uh, so you know six or seven hours a day of football but it paid off because the young people after the Steelers would come to Kennedy and that kinda kinda got the ball rolling for the success we had at Kennedy. During the regular season El Cerrito delivered a bitter defeat of Kennedy 41-0. The game was played at Kennedy in Richmond. The same field as the Richmond Steelers Pop Warner Football Organization uses to play its home games. It's also the field where many Kennedy El Cerrito players played as teammates on the Steelers. Peter Hewitt Keith Alexander, Mario Farr, Eric Pitts, and Conrad Strassheim, to name a few. The Richmond Steelers had a great coaching staff. The late coaches, Fred Harris, Roscoe, Jim Gulledge, and Ray Vargas. These coaching legends also helped shape many El Cerrito players. Thomas Gary, David Bowling. Tori Lovett, Forrest Coleman, and Lee Brannon. We had a lot of community support that would just come and look at us, praise us, um, tell us, you know, that we were going to be good at doing something. So, I, I, you know, even back from the Richmond Steelers, uh, we had our old coaches, Coach Donald, Coach Fred, Coach Roscoe. Um, it, it was just a blessing to grow up in that time, man, because there was so much community support. Um, you know, whether your father was in the house, you have fathers at the football field, you have fathers in the community. Um, so for the most part, it, it was just important that we all had that support of just knowing that we were going to do something good. And we just, you know, just being there every day. That, that's what it was all about. Of all the Soul Bowl alumni, no one loomed larger than public address announcer Sandy Berman. Sandy Berman was the official voice of the NCS and teacher at El Cerrito High School. Before his passing, Berman had announced hundreds of football and basketball games, including countless NCS championship series. In addition to Berman, the Soul Bowl has lost several members since 1984. The late Tracy Purvis, linebacker Robert Moses, Papa Wilson, Anthony Robinson, Terrence Martin, Lauren Dollar Bill Hill. Last but not least, Kimmy Marie McDonald and Charles Phillips. And on this day, the 25th anniversary of Kennedy El Cerrito, we want to remember each one of these individuals for their contribution to the Soul Bowl, the greatest rivalry in Bay Area history. Leading up to the game, Kennedy team captain Mario Farr was quite emotional saying, this is it. We have to win. We're calling this one the Soul Bowl. The Soul Bowl refers to the many Richmond-based players, boyhood friends, and former Steelers now playing at the Coliseum. It also refers to the spirit of West County and the intensity of both schools, the nastiness, dislike, and sheer hatred, at least at the time. Whenever these two teams played, it was always standing room only. In fact, if you did not make it to the stadium two hours before game time, you didn't get in. Kennedy El Cerrito games had an electric atmosphere like no other. 
They bought out the best in each other. They needed each other to compete. I mean, on the campus atmosphere, I think it was it was uh, it was just you know a dynamic that that's undescribable. Everybody was just excited. You know, um, there was you know events that were going on campus. You know, rallies. It was just the atmosphere on campus was was just like. Um, a cloud nine, so to speak, kind of atmosphere because no one believed it could happen. You know, no one believed, even when the playoffs first started, you know, that was like the furthest thing in the back of everybody's mind. And then after the first round, I think there was a buzz in the media that's saying, you know, could it be? You know, but of course, there, you know, there was a the second round, then the third round, then the semifinals, then the finals. So it was just like, you know, it was like a, a, a mention of it, but it was like a far distant mention that, you know, could this actually be? And then I think after the second round, it was like, wow, you know, this could really happen. Going into a game where you have the talent of uh, the quarterback Wells and uh, the outstanding receivers, uh, you know, I was def I was definitely worried. I don't think it was tough, you know, not to make an excuse. It was a tough week of practice. The Kennedy El Cerrito battles of the 80s were backyard brawls. No matter football, basketball, or baseball, the games were tough and intense. Skyline and De La Salle were tough opponents too. Most fans outside the Bay Area only think about De La Salle when discussing powerhouse football programs. But let the record show that well before the streak and the De La Salle hype, there was Kennedy and El Cerrito and this once in a lifetime game we called the Soul Bowl. During the press conference, NCS Commissioner Paul Gadini stated what everyone already knew. Kennedy was a long shot to win the 3A title. But Gadini believed that it validated the NCS's playoff structure, which is still in place today. Kennedy is a great human interest story, he said. On the other hand, El Cerrito entered the 1984 playoffs for the second straight year, losing to Monta Vista in 1983 with talented players such as James Pops Mitchell, Antoine Pickett, and Al Fortier. It was a rivalry amongst coaches that people still remember. You know, it was always, and, and I, I want to say, you know, I could stand be corrected, but I want to say there was a picture around that time of, of the media hype. They had a, a, a coach, uh, I mean, a picture of Milo and a picture of Alameda, and it was right next to each other. Um, if, if my memory recalls, but I remember seeing that picture. Um, and so that was one of the other dynamics. It was a rivalry, not just amongst schools and amongst players, but it was amongst, you know, coaches. The coaches in those years, in the early years, they left the game on the field. We could get together and they, uh, there was a, you know, a, a feeling between the coaches where we could get together, a, a, say at a local establishment after the game, and you know, and talk about the game. We used to do that at that restaurant on San Pablo on Friday nights. The Kennedy people, the Richmond people, the El Cerrito, we we would all see each other after. The, I don't think that's there anymore. NCS Commissioner Gandini went on to add. We can honestly say that we felt Kennedy wouldn't be around at the Coliseum. We asked schools we thought would be in the championship game to submit team photos. Kennedy was not one of them.
On December 1st, 1984, a crowd of over 9,000 attended the Soul Bowl. Gaucho's 41, Wells lofted a rainbow to Terry Obi, who had seven yards on defender John Pickett. Obi snatched the ball on the two and breezed into the end zone. The conversion failed. The Eagles held El Cerrito to just three plays. And on their next possession, after a four yard punt by Keith Alexander, Kennedy took over at the 38. Wells and Obi connected again as Obi leaped over Kevin Vaughn at the one. It appeared as though Obi's momentum carried him into the end zone but the officials marked the ball a yard short. Two plays later, Ed Westbrook squeezed into the end zone. Wells was sacked by Robert Moses on a two-point conversion try, and Kennedy led 12-0 with one minute and 27 seconds in the opening period. Kennedy used a triple I set employed by offensive coordinator Calvin Miles. Miles got the scheme while at Grambling and from watching film of Jerry Rice of Mississippi Valley State. This wide open offense surprised the always tough defense. Kennedy ran the West Coast offense well before it became popular and in vogue. In the second quarter, the Eagles began to self-destruct. After Gaucho quarterback Ed Robinette fumbled and Mario Farr recovered. The Eagles had the ball on the 27th but were pushed back 21 yards in penalties and losses. Penalties would plague the Eagles all night as they were whistled 11 times for 111 yards. The Eagles had numerous penalties, but the offense moved the ball at will. On their next possession, the Eagles had the ball for more than four minutes, but couldn't gain a first down. A short punt gave El Cerrito the ball on the Eagles 42. Milo reached into his bag of tricks, where Tracy Purvis took a pitch from Robinette and hit David Bowling on a 32-yard pass play. This was the biggest play of the game thus far. Well, you know, Travy Purvis, we put in a special play uh, where we, in fact, he was lined up at tight end, and we pitched back to him, and he came back on a tight end reverse, and he threw to, I believe it was D Dave Bowling. Three plays later, Jesse Lee stormed into the end zone from seven yards out. Robinette's pass to James Jones cut the lead to 12-8 
at halftime. In the third quarter, the Gauchos came out of the locker room with the purpose marching 69 yards on 14 plays, culminated by Lee's three-yard scoring run. The drive took seven minutes and 14 seconds off the clock. The conversion failed, but the Gauchos had their first lead of the night. The key play on the drive was a four-yard punt fake by Keith Alexander for a first down. The momentum started to change, said Coach Milo. I really felt we would come back in the third quarter but instead they came right back and the comeback was vintage wells with plenty of help from his friends on the first play of the fourth quarter with a first and ten on the kennedy 24 wells rifled a 38 yard bomb to rod moore cats being burners uh, speed agility and a set of hands that was unimaginable uh, it wasn't anything practically that was thrown those cats couldn't catch or couldn't go get uh, the particular catch that you're talking about um, I've seen photos of it I, I vividly remember it but uh, it was pretty much Rod running uh, across the left part of the of the field and just pretty much almost sacrificing his entire body uh, and you can out you, in the picture. I mean, you can almost see the whites of his eyes. His eyes just got bigger, dilating, um, just to see him. You know, just knowing that he was about to do something big. And